Our second scripture lesson for today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 1, verses 8 through 21. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for the Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all of their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose name were Shifra and Puah, when you are helping the Hebrew woman during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill it. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwife arrives. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, God gave them families of their own. Please pray with me. Dear God, let this scripture work its way deep into our hearts. Help it to draw us closer to you by the decisions we make and the actions which we take. Amen. Well, looking at what is in the lectionary the next few weeks, I decided that instead I was going to do a sermon series on unsung heroes of the Bible. And so I picked two for this week, people that you may not have remembered existed, or maybe you've never even heard of them, Shifra and Pua. And I was sitting down to write this sermon on Thursday, September 26th. While I sat down to do it, I was distracted because a con congressional hearing was going on in Washington, D.C., concerning whistleblowers and an official complaint and all of these actions of the government were going on. And I had to step back from the politics of our times for a minute and consider this within the history of the world. My friends, we should be extremely grateful that we live in a democracy where such an investigation is possible. We live in a time where we have the freedom to question, to engage in civil disobedience. We live in a country where it is legal to protest, to demonstrate. We have laws that we can use to become whistleblowers when we think that our government is doing something wrong. The existence of such a whistleblower process or even the idea of a Congress of elected individuals leading such an investigation that whole bit, this whole thing going on, that would have been unimaginable during the time of our scripture lesson today from Exodus. Instead, the Egyptian governmental system was very much a monarchy, a system where the pharaoh had the ultimate power over life and death. And so it's in great awe today that we read about the courageous actions of these two unsung heroes from Exodus. Now, the instructions to the Pharaoh 
to those two midwives were very clear. Their expectations were very understandable. And what we may not appreciate today is that this was not just a friendly suggestion. A command from the Pharaoh was enforceable by death or imprisonment. And it was pretty clear. When you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. Now, there's no, there was no ultrasound technology in Egypt at this time. And so the only way for the midwives to know the sex of that newborn infant would be at that moment of birth. That first moment when the child is completely out of the birth canal. Those first critical moments where the mucus needs to be cleaned out of the infant's nose and mouth so that they can take their first screaming breaths. And it's in that most critical moment in the life of that newborn child for the choice of the midwives, for their choice to either follow the instructions of the Pharaoh and to kill that baby boy, or else they could act in civil disobedience to the instructions of the Pharaoh and help that baby boy to live, risking their own lives in the process. Now, it is tough for us to imagine what we ourselves would do if we were put into that situation. I know I always like to think of myself that I would do the ethically right thing, that I would help that newborn baby boy to live. We like to think that we would be a bit as brave as Shifra and Pua, and that we would stand up against authorities, stand up for what we believe in. But then I ask myself, how far do I actually go in this democracy of ours to actually live out and act on the things that I do believe in? What do I actually risk? What do I actually do? Also in the news this week was Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old girl from Sweden who has become a leading climate activist. Inspired by the students from Parkland, Florida, who went on strike and demonstrated for gun control, in August of 2018, Greta decided to go on strike from the ninth grade to demonstrate in front of her Swedish government for three weeks before their country's general election. Her message was simple. Greta wanted the government officials in Sweden to do something to address climate change now. Since that first three-week strike in 2018, Greta has been skipping school every Friday and has been demonstrating for climate change instead. She sits out on the sidewalk with her son. Her movement has caught people's attention and it has caught on. And this year, this whole year, she has taken a sabbatical from school for this whole year to become a global climate change activist, inspiring millions of other school kids from over 100 countries to shame their parents and their governmental leaders in order to reduce the carbon footprint in their own countries. Her words are blunt and bold. At the United Nations Climate Action Summit held in New York City this week, Greta was forceful in her speech on Monday, September 23rd, as she scolded the adults in attendance. She said, this is all wrong. I shouldn't be standing here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope? How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away? 
Then in her speech, after outlining the absolutely stunning accelerated rate of climate change and our inadequate attempts by humans so far to radically reduce our CO2 emissions, she ended her speech with this line. You are failing us, but young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. The speech has gotten over a million views already since Monday on YouTube. While Greta Thunberg is skipping school with her parents' permission in order to protest for climate change, other people are facing much more serious legal consequences for the actions that they are taking in order to actually live out what they believe. In Cleveland Heights, Ohio, the Forest Hills Presbyterian Church decided to actually act on what they believe. They are currently giving sanctuary to a woman who is under orders to be deported by ICE. The woman, Leonor Garcia, uh, had previously lived and worked in the Akron era, area for 10 years. And she has four children, ages six through 21, who are all American citizens. Since 2011, she was in full compliance with immigration officials and she reported her location to them. And ICE, who because she had citizen children and because Leonor had no criminal record and because she was gainfully employed and paying her taxes and being a productive member of the community, ICE allowed her to stay in the USA. However, in 2018, with the increased political pressure to deport every single person eligible to be deported, ICE told Leonor to pack her bags and that she would be sent back to her childhood home in Mexico. Two days before she was scheduled to depart, Forest Hills Presbyterian decided to step up and they decided to live into what they believed was the right thing to do. So they offered sanctuary for her, an offer Leonor decided to take in order to not be separated from her children. Consequently, the church set up an apartment for Leonor in their church building, and members of the church take turns donating food and eating with her for dinners, and women volunteer to spend the night in the church so she doesn't have to be alone all night in the building. On the weekends, Leonore's children come to the church to visit her, and they will sometimes spend the night with her in her apartment there. Leonore herself, who doesn't want any charity, appreciates the sanctuary that the PCUSA congregation is giving her. So she cleans the church building twice a week. She volunteers in the church's food pantry. She cooks meals every week for the needy, and then she also deep cleans the kitchen to her standard. But she cannot leave the building. ICE has fastened an ankle bracelet on Leonor, and they are tracking her location. They have said that they will not disrupt the operation of the church and its activities to come in and remove Leonor, but if she leaves the building, they will take her away. Consequently, the church, which is her sanctuary, has also become her prison. The church also has a volunteer for legal counsel for Leonor, who's trying to get some sort of legal resolution to the situation. But with immigration still being used as a divisive, hot-button political issue in the upcoming election, there is not much hope that her situation will change very quickly. So what does all of this mean to those of us who are here today? Well, each of us, we say that we have things that we believe in. We say that we have issues that really truly motivate us. We each have causes that are near and dear to our hearts. 
For some people here, it may be climate change, like Greta Thunberg. For others here, it may be Camp Greenwood and the actions of the Presbytery of Lake Michigan. For some, it could be the homeless, and that you're really enlivened by supporting family products. Or maybe you're like Forest Hills Presbyterian Church in Ohio, and your heart goes out to those people who are scheduled to be deported. For others here, it could be a passion to teach children or to give people access to music. Or maybe it's to teach people about robotics. Or maybe you really enjoy caring for elders. Whatever your passion is, whatever makes your soul burn with the love of Christ, today I encourage you to take your inspiration from Shifra and Pua and to really be willing to put everything on the line to make a difference. Because being a follower of Jesus is much more than sitting around the tables in fellowship hall after church and eating some cookies or sitting in a pew for an hour a week. <coughs> being a follower of Jesus means that you are committing yourself to really make a real difference in the world in the name of Jesus Christ. That you are willing to sacrifice that you are willing to be uncomfortable, to risk some of your time and your money and your talents and your energy to push back against the forces that are keeping the kingdom of God of love to become a reality. Because, my friends, the struggles for your neighbors is real. And the discipleship that Jesus calls us to is also real. I pray we will all take that message to heart.